Welcome to our second lecture covering module four. In this lecture, we're going to continue our discussion along the employment timeline. We, in our first lecture, talked about the recruitment aspect of the hiring process, and now we're going to talk about the testing aspect with particular emphasis upon pre-employment testing. So let's begin. Um, we're going to talk about employment tests, and of course, when we talk about employment tests, it's useful to think about the two interests that we're balancing, or the, the, the law and the regulations balance. One is, of course, the employer's completely legitimate interest in making sure that it hires the best workers who are going to be able to be successful in the position and that are not going to be using unlawful or intoxicating substances while at work. All of those are completely reasonable, logical expectations that employers have. But that's not the only concern that we have. Another concern is the employee's a legitimate interest in privacy um, and also an interest in um, not getting into a situation where they may be self-incriminating. Um, and then, of course, we want to make sure that we're avoiding situations that could have some discriminatory impact, either directly, as in a disparate treatment situation, or indirectly as in a disparate impact situation. And so as we go through the various rules today, you're gonna to see that they're balancing these two interests. They're both very valid, uh, but are in some senses in, in uh, intention with one another. Okay, so let's first of all define terms. We have the concept of pre-employment testing. It means exactly what you think it means. It's testing that occurs before that a final hiring decision is made. We'll talk about this as being in two phases, one before an offer is made, and the other after an offer is made, but before employment actually begins. And there's lots of different categories of this type of testing. Um, here are some examples, integrity, honesty, drug and alcohol abuse, skills tests, HIV status, um, there can be other types of tests. Um, and then we have the issue of a job analysis um, data. And this really is looking to what does the particular person, if he or she uh, receives the job, what will he or she do um, day to day in that job? What tasks will be performed? And what skills are necessary to perform those tasks? Obviously, if a test that the employer is considering doing doesn't test for one of the skills of the job uh, requires, then that test isn't a very smart test for the employer to offer. And it does like it is likely to infringe upon the privacy or other interests of that individual. So this is an important part of the component. You may recall in the previous lecture we talked about the need or, or the desirability of coming up with position descriptions that identify the particular skills necessary for the job. Another important concept is eligibility testing, and we're going to contrast this with ineligibility testing. And you probably can tell from the names that they are testing completely different tasks. So eligibility tests is when we're looking at is this potential employer, it's me, employee, capable of doing the job successfully? Is he or she eligible to do the job? So it's, it's defined in a positive sense. So in this situation, we might be looking to see um, how quickly this person can do a simple arithmetic. And so obviously the people with the highest scores or the quickest scores or the most accurate scores will be the ones we would look to first for hiring. And uh, if we're looking for, say, salespeople, we might be interested in hiring very outgoing people. And so we might be looking for people who score high on an extrovert scale or something along those lines. Um, so the goal here is to find the best person for the job. So it's designed to rank people with our most eligible or most desirable person coming to the top. So for this test to be valid, in other words, to be usable to avoid a dis disparate impact type claim, is we have to show that the, that the eligibility of testing is job related. Again, a math test may make perfect sense, or some a change-making test may make perfect sense if you are a cashier, but it may not make sense at all if uh, the person you're hiring is a janitor who doesn't handle money in his or her job. So we wanna make sure that the skill is job-related. 
and that is consistent with business necessity. And here we have, we've defined this term in the past, but just a little reminder. This is a defense to a disparate impact case based upon the employer's need for the policy as a legitimate requirement for the job. Um, a cashier needs to be able to make change. There's just no two ways about that. Now I suppose you could have um, an, one of those automatic coin dispensers. Um, so you could say there's a possibility that a cashier doesn't need to make change, but sometimes a, a customer might turn around and say, well, you know, I don't want all of this, uh, all of these pennies. Can you turn this into a quarter, this, this particular amount of money or something along those lines? And so I would say even with an automatic coin dispenser, the cashier in order to provide uh, the best customer service is going to need to be able to make change. So here's the scenario. This employer, Ant Builders, wants to hire laborers who need to lift 100 pounds to perform their job. Bob's uh, 5'10", weighs 140 pounds. He wants the job. I guess I have a, let me switch this to Ant, I apologize. Let me change one of the names here. So Ant wants to test Bob's physical stamina to see if he's capable of doing the job. And according to how he, they test it will determine whether it's a valid test or not, but the concept is valid. So you might have Bob uh, do, you know, spend 30 minutes doing typical work tasks, um, maybe carrying these 100 pound objects from one place to another. Now, one thing you want to watch out for if you have these tests is you want to make sure that Bob is not doing actual work for the company because then you have to pay Bob for it, right? So you'd want to have your uh, testing place in such a setting that it really doesn't benefit the company um, uh, in terms of moving um, material around. So this would be testing for eligibility under these circumstances. And of course, if we have eligibility testing, we obviously have ineligibility testing. And so this is designed to make sure somebody doesn't have a problem that's going to prevent their success. So instead of ruling people in, which is what we do with eligibility testing, we're ruling people out. Um, now this doesn't establish that a person is going to be, you know, the fact that we don't rule a person out, meaning they pass certain tests, that doesn't mean they're the best candidate for the job. It simply means they don't have a particular impediment that would have made their employment disposition problematic. So why do we do ineligibility testing? Well, it's to reduce the possibility of injury. Obviously, if I am um, somebody who has uh, back problems, uh, I probably ought not uh, be hired into a position where I need to lift, lift 100 pounds on a routine basis. If I do, very likely I'm going to exacerbate my injury, and that's not good for me, but it's also not good for the workers' comp rate that this particular employer might have. It also helps predict uh, in the employee performance, um, as does eligibility testing, but this one, because it's ruling out, is really just designed to weed out people who really probably aren't going to be able to perform. Um, imagine somebody whose vision problems are so severe that they can't distinguish between a dime and a nickel. Well, that person probably isn't going to be an effective cashier because they aren't going to be making correct change. They're not going to be putting the change in the correct containers in the uh, cash register. And so those would be uh, uh, customer service problems. And then it, again, we're going to test with a worker's comp element. Uh, that that would likely increase the employer's experience rating for workers' comp taxes. Okay, so we're going to look at four, five, me, five particular categories of testing that employers often consider doing. The first is perhaps the most controversial, well, maybe not the most controversial, but certainly a controversial one, and that is the topic of drug testing. So let's consider that. There is a federal statute called the Drug-Free Workplace Act. It applies generally to federal employees. And since we're talking about private employment, it, it isn't likely to be directly applicable to um, your clients, your private employer clients, or to your clients who are maybe employees of private employers. But some private sector companies do choose to use the uh, Drug-Free Workplace Act as a model for how they ought to run their own program. It's an optional thing, but it's, it can make sense. And certainly an employer is permitted to use this as guidelines. That would be a, a relatively sensible thing to do under those circumstances. 
And there's a variety of ways you can test for drug and alcohol issues. Um, one is to take a urine specimen or a, a blood specimen. Another is to take um, a, a hair sample. Now, the hair sample is less invasive, um, but you could say it could be more uh, cos cosmetically um, uh, unfortunate. And some people have very short hair, especially some men, or perhaps are bald, so there may not be a lot of hair that you can borrow. If you use the hair sample, what you are going to get from the employer's perspective might be very helpful in that you get to see uh, the pattern of drug exposure for a significantly longer period of time. On the other hand, an employee might say reasonably, yes, in the past I have used, for example, uh, marijuana, but it's been a month since I've used marijuana. And so my um, marijuana usage 30 days ago isn't going to affect me today when I go to work. Um, even though when you test my hair, you may be able to see evidence of that marijuana usage from a long time ago. Um, a, a related issue on the um, uh, uh, testing for uh, they, they use as hair samples is kind of what you're getting at. Um, uh, if you take a urine or blood sample, and typically urine is, is the mechanism that is used, is you are getting a snapshot of a very brief period of time. Most drugs go out of your system within a matter of a few days. Uh, there's an old saying in the employment law business that really drug, urine-based drug tests aren't really drug tests at all, they're IQ tests. They're about whether the, the employee is smart enough to uh, Google how long they have to abstain from whatever their drug of choice is in order to get a clean urine test. And so it's not a very effective uh, way of actually seeing what drug test is like because honestly, in a pre-employment situation, the employer doesn't really care on a particular day whether that person is positive or negative because they're probably not going to work on that particular day. And more relevantly, what the employer is looking for is this person somebody who is likely to periodically or habitually imbibe or consume these type of illegal substances. And again, if you have at all a savvy drug user, um, he or she is going to be able to abstain for long enough so the test comes back negative despite the fact that the person is uh, uh, the user of that particular substance. Another thing you'll sometimes see employers do is putting up a sign saying they use drug testing when in fact they don't. They use it to scare off people that are drug users and because they don't want those individuals working for them. And so then once the employee or the uh, potential employee completes the interview process and is expecting to hear that they need to go to a drug testing facility, they're told, no, we don't really do that anymore. And so the idea is that the real drug user who knew he would test positive, at least on that particular day, isn't gonna apply. Um, so that can be effective, and you could say that builds a culture of distrust in your organization because now that person you just hired um, may not trust things that you say because you've already demonstrated that you're willing to uh, be deceptive with employees. Okay, so drug testing is an ineligibility test. The mere fact that I happen to test negative for drugs does not mean that I am eligible or qualified for a particular position. I may be woefully unqualified for that job despite my uh, negative drug test. There's lots of different times that this can happen and we've identified five here. These are the most common one, one is, which is the focus of this particular section of our course, it's prior to hiring. Um, then the next is going to be as part of periodic medical examination. So this is unusual. In most places of employment, employers do not give employees periodic medical examinations. But there are certain fields where that is makes sense, especially when the uh, employee is exposed to potentially dangerous chemicals or other types of um, things that can affect the health of the person. So it could be part of that process. Um, when an employee has been, uh, has uh, admitted to drug use and is entered into a drug rehabilitation program, um, 
oftentimes in which they use the company's health benefits to participate in that program, sometimes they are subject to drug screens in that case. Now, I would discourage you from using this as an automatic part of the program. Um, so I would say that this one is one that I'm gonna put a little asterisk by and say this is not probably a best practice. I'm not saying you can't design a program where this could work, but I would not ordinarily say this is the best plan. This next one is oftentimes called post-accident. I added this, by the way, this was not in the original um, version that you perhaps saw in your notes. Um, but this is when somebody has acted in a way that's unexpected. Perhaps they've been in an accident, or, and this would be typically be in a company vehicle or on company time. Perhaps they have been walking in an unsteady way or have had slurred speech or their pupils are dilated, or their eyes are bloodshot, or they read of uh, alcohol or marijuana, things along those lines. Uh, perhaps they have had an outburst that seems out of character or inappropriate for the workforce. Under those circumstances, you would call that suspicion testing or post-accident testing and ask that person to uh, submit to the test. Now this can be uh, somewhat dicey. It's a good idea to have two supervisors confirm uh, the uh, suspicious behavior if we're not talking post-accident. If it is post-accident, it's a good idea to require the testing um, no matter, even in situations where it's absolutely clear that the employee did nothing wrong. For example, the employee was rear-ended at a red light. The rule should just be every time there's an accident, you got to go to uh, post-accident testing. That way, you're not having to split the baby and figure out, well, how much was my client, how much was my employee responsible for versus the other person. You're oftentimes not going to know who is responsible for the, for the situation because you're only hearing one side of the story. So it's best to have an automatic part of the procedure. Finally, we can have random drug testing. Now you do need to truly have a random system. There's uh, ways of doing that. A lot of times it's a good idea for the uh, random names that, that are randomly drawn to be uh, developed outside of the facility, if it's a multi-facility unit, sent to the facility. So the facility, there's no potential for anyone at the facility to be um, uh, cooking the books or adding people's names or removing people's names from the list. Um, there's a variety of ways of doing the random testing. Uh, some systems will have it so that everyone is in the pool every single time. Of course, in that system, it's possible that one person's name might come up two weeks in a row. Um, you could also have a system that says, well, once you've been tested, uh, you aren't going to be in the rotation for some period of time. Again, that might make sense, but if you make the time too long, it might make that person feel like, oh, yippee, I can have some fun this weekend, right? Um, and so you, you'd want to be careful that it's not too long between the times. Um, so uh, that's a helpful thing to keep in mind. Main employee refuse to be tested. Well, I mean, I guess the short answer is yes, but it's likely to be an employment decision. Obviously, we should not force an employee to be tested. If he says no, then you can say that's your choice, but we will assume the test results would have been positive and then proceed on that basis. And usually, the first time you get a positive, it doesn't mean that you are going to be dismissed. And by the way, going back to this result previously when I discounted this, um, when you have people that have positives, it is appropriate in that situation to have some system in which they are more likely to be their names to be pulled. Um, and so you can, but you can still include those names in the random system. So you might have it so that, you know, instead of there being a 3% uh, chance of that particular person's name is pulled for the next uh, six months, you make it so that there's a 20% chance that their name will be pulled. Um, every time the list are pulled in the next uh, six months or something along those lines. So I don't, I wouldn't necessarily tie um, the drug test to the person's completion of the rehab program, but tying it to a positive in the workplace, that seems to me a more justifiable approach. Anyway, so yes, the employee can say no, but you have to treat it as positive under those circumstances. Now, in Texas, there are very few restraints on employees in terms of drug testing. 
There are plenty of other states though that have significant constraints. So if you happen to have workers who are working in other states, uh, don't assume that the answer to this is no, the employee can't refuse without losing his job or, or being considered a positive. Make sure you understand how the, the works, how those rules work in those states. Um, uh, it's, it's mandatory subject for collective bargaining is um, random drug testing of the employees. But let me unpack a few terms here. Collective bargaining is a process by which a union and an employer arrive at a contract that will be uh, uh, binding on the employer and on all of the employees in the unit. It will establish the rules of engagement, the rules of employment for all of those employees who are part of that particular bargaining unit. Not necessarily the whole workforce, just those particular folks. It may just be a particular department like the shipping department or the packing department. Um, uh, when I say that it's a mandatory subject of bargaining, um, there, are, there are three categories of, of bargaining topics. One of the mandatory subjects of bargaining, one of the permissible subject of bargaining, and one of the prohibited subjects of bargaining. You can probably figure out how the, the items fall. Mandatory means that an employer can't unilaterally roll out a random drug testing program without uh, participating in bargaining over with the union. So uh, it is obviously, and that makes sense because a random drug testing does necessarily obviously invade the privacy of union members. And so it makes sense that that should be such a bargaining. If we're talking about public employers, there are additional concerns than the ones we've already talked about, most specifically the ones in the Fourth Amendment which prohibit unreasonable searches and seizures. There are some state constitutions that have similar protections for private employers and sometimes state employees. But we don't have to worry about those in Texas, at least not from the perspective of the employer. Um, but even when there are limitations for public employers, um, the public employers can still test for safety sensitive jobs. I'm going to share with you a story. This is quite a dated story, but when I was in private practice, um, I had a client who uh, was a public utility, and um, it had meter readers who would go around and check uh, to make sure, I guess this was before everything was automated to the extent it was today, but they would make sure that the meters were in fact uh, reading correctly and that the, 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 the billing process was appropriate for the customer. Uh, this was a utility, so it was not a public employer, but because it was a utility, it had some aspects of the public employerness about it because it was a type of utility that everybody had to use. And so, you know, people did not have the option of choosing which utility was going to use. Uh, this utility, by the way, was not in the Dallas Fort Worth market, so don't be concerned as I go forward with the story. Anyway, so one of its meters, so as, as part of this, uh, situation because the meter readers were obviously driving around from home to home um, entering people's backyards to check the meters and also uh, driving uh, to one location to another and they were also responsible for doing things like you know sniffing for uh, gas leaks and things along those lines anyway it was considered a safety sensitive job and so uh, workers in that position were subject to uh, random drug screens. Well, this particular employee, and this was a unionized facility uh, unit, and so this particular worker, we'll call him Bob, um, submitted to a random drug test and he came back positive. Um, I think it was for marijuana. I could be mistaken about the drug. And as a result, the uh, collective bargaining agreement provided that he would be suspended for um, I don't know if it was 60 days or what, but it was a significant period of suspension. And as is very common in those cases, the union, what's it, what, they, what they call, grieved the complaint, meaning they objected to the complaint. In most unions, this is pretty much of an automatic procedure. Whenever an employee receives a consequence, maybe not a verbal warning, but a consequence that is financially impactful, then the uh, union will grieve the complaint even if every T was dot crossed and every I was dotted, even if the union doesn't really see a problem. 
you could look upon this as the union is uh, making sure it's providing excellent customer service to its members by being responsive to uh, the challenges that that member faces. So the union grieved this particular claim and it ultimately went to binding arbitration. And in that case, all the evidence was presented that the chain of custody of the sample was well documented, um, the test results were clear and unambiguous, the employee did not claim that he had, was on some kind of medication that could have caused a false positive or anything like that. Um, I don't think the employee confessed to the drug use, but I don't think any of us really had a question in our minds that he in fact had used uh, the substance. Um, and so uh, while the union was, you know, going through the steps, I don't think that the business agent uh, who was representing the employee uh, was, was focused too much on this being an, an injustice. Anyway, so we filed our post-submission brief, which we documented the evidence, and the uh, business agent also submitted a brief where he basically didn't have much of a defense. So it seemed like an open and shut case, we got back from the arbitrator, though, a bunch of gobbledygook about the Fourth Amendment. <laughs> uh, of course, the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply to private employers. It doesn't even apply to public utilities. And the um, arbitrator wasn't claiming that because it was a public utility, it wasn't fully a private employer. I think what was happening is that um, the arbitrator philosophically disagreed with random drug tests for this type of position. And so he was trying to figure out some legal leg he could stand on, even though it really wasn't a very good legal leg at all. Anyway, the a client was outraged by the result, not surprisingly, and I decided to take it to court to see if they could unenforce that arbitrator decision. Uh, generally speaking, it's very difficult to overturn an arbitrator decision through the court system. You know, if you have a case go ordinarily through the court system, you can always appeal it to a higher court. And that higher court is probably gonna affirm the lower court's decision, but there's probably about a 10% chance that you're gonna win on appeal. It's not a complete waste of your time. But generally speaking, in arbitrator cases, it's almost unheard of that um, a, a, a court is going to overturn an arbitrator's decision. You really need to have a very, very clear abuse of discretion on the part of the arbitrator. And so we went into this, uh, this court system um, think, telling our client, oh, we'll do it, but we don't think we have much of a chance. And we were successful, much to our surprise, because again, generally uh, district courts, if the federal district court that we went to, district courts are loath to overturn an arbitration setting. So we were ultimately successful because the argument that the arbitrator made for a private employer was kind of beyond ludicrous given the law that existed. And of course, uh, this particular worker was transportation work uh, related since he would travel around in a company vehicle uh, from meter to meter. So again, we don't have a statute in this area, but these are the types of things you often see in statutes. And even though we don't have these particular requirements in Texas, they're probably a good way of considering what your program ought to include. So the way I would approach it is have these elements, understand that if somebody messes up and doesn't dot every I and cross every T, you're not violating a statute in Texas, but you're following best practices when you do. So you're going to want to provide some kind of written notice to the employee so that he or she knows that alone may be enough to cause the employee to stop using the drugs or to quit because he decides, no, I don't want to submit to those tests or I don't want to give up the drugs. Um, and so that solves a problem for you. Uh, you want to also give the employee a copy of um, the process in which th that's going to be followed. You might even provide a bit of training. And this can hopefully uh, make your employees uh, believers in the program because in many cases their safety can be at risk especially if it's an industrial setting if somebody is intoxicated driving a forklift around they may run into somebody or they may knock over some shelving that causes somebody on the other side to be crushed and so many times employees are the strongest advocates for those programs uh, 
in a safety sensitive type of work situation. And so communicating why you're doing this, especially when you focus on employee and customer safety, can be a powerful message. You'll want to use appropriate labs to, to actually conduct the testing, ones that um, have lots of checks in place so that the results are trustworthy. And you'll want to perform a confirmatory test because um, that's going to be the best way to make sure that there were no errors. So usually there will be two samples submitted. Um, and that way they can be tested separately. To, and obviously if one's positive and the other's negative, then that uh, probably means you treat that as a negative. Um, employees should be given the test results in a written form so they have that documentation, whether it's positive or negative. And uh, before the results actually come down, they should be given an opportunity to confidentially explain um, any kind of medication they may be on. For example, if they are taking a prescription medication uh, because perhaps they had dental surgery or some other surgery, well, they may well test positive for an opioid. And uh, it's perfectly appropriate that they're taking an op opioid if it's a prescribed medication and they don't come to work in an intoxicated manner. Samples should be collected in a way that respects the privacy of the employee. Um, ordinarily, you don't want to have somebody um, in the uh, facility with you when you are giving the urine sample. On the other hand, you need to make sure that uh, the sample is in fact um, uh, urine and that it is in fact from that particular employee Sometimes these samples are immediately, um, a temperature is taken of the sample to confirm that it is in fact uh, from the human body at that particular time. Um, and so um, those are some things to keep in mind um, so that the modesty of the employee can be respected. Um, the Omnibus uh, Transportation Safety Testing Act does regulate drug testing for transportation employees. Uh, for example, ex example of that would be um, um, over the road um, uh, truckers. And so you're gonna wanna have a way to provide samples that are tamper proof once they're sealed so that uh, no one can contaminate that or intentionally or unintentionally. You'll wanna have a chain of custody to show it went from Bob's custody to Sally's custody to Larry's custody. Um, and you'll want to again have that secondary cat test to confirm those results. And you'll need to have um, a medical review officer review them in the event that there is something, um, again, maybe the, uh, the employee is taking some substance or something along those lines. There's lots of mythology about drug tests and lots of various products that are supposed to more quickly remove drugs from your system. Now, no poppy, no poppy seeds on a bagel are not going to cause you to test positive for opioids. Um, no, most of the, I think all of those uh, products that you might use to purge your system are not going to remove uh, the uh, drugs from your system significantly faster than they would otherwise. So the Drug-Free Workplace Act, again, we're applying just to federal government employees again, makes those same requirements that we just talked about really from the perspective of the, um, uh, uh, the state law perspective. But one thing that I think is a good idea is um, these two points. If you're going to have a drug testing program of your current employees, it's highly, highly recommended that you offer some type of drug counseling or drug um, uh, support group uh, for individuals. Um, these are folks who are already in your employee, you've already made a commitment to them and they made a commitment to you. And so if you're expecting them to remain drug free, you have to recognize that that may be a struggle for some of your workers. And so it is a good idea, maybe through the employee assistance program or some other programs to offer these types of programs for the employees. And it's good when you're rolling this program out to communicate that to employees so that that employee can seek that assistance before his or her name comes up on the random drug screen so that the problem can be solved before it becomes a problem that the company is aware of. And then you ought to have a progressive discipline approach for drug use violations. 
maybe a suspension of you know a month for the first time or two weeks for the first time maybe a longer suspension for the second time and then a termination on the third time that might be a reasonable approach and um, that's going to depend in part upon what the nature of the person's job is if the person is dri driving driving vehicles uh, then you may well just want to have a one um, one warning before the termination um, and you may well uh, if you decide not to suspend, and when I say suspend, I mean suspend without pay, but if you decide not to suspend, you may require that person to do another job, and you may, if that other job earns at a lower pay rate, you may reduce that person's pay during that time until they can demonstrate that they are no longer uh, using drugs in a way that's going to compromise the safety of people on the roads. Let's talk about the Americans Disabilities Act because this is an important factor in a drug testing. So the Americans Disabilities Act obviously protects Americans who have disabilities. Um, and that includes people who are applying for jobs as well as people who are currently employed in positions. And so you may be thinking, how does drug and alcohol testing impact that? Is um, illegal drug uh, addiction a disability? under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Well, I think we'd all say that it's a disability. It is, in some way, makes you less able than people who do not experience uh, drug addiction. Um, but it is not a disability as the term is defined in the Americans with Disabilities Act. In fact, current drug use is excluded from coverage under the Americans with Disabilities Act if it is uh, illegally obtained drugs. If it's a prescription drug, it's a bit of a gray area. If I am uh, uh, getting my prescription drugs that I'm abusing in an unlawful way, maybe going to Mexico and picking them up there, or uh, getting them as a street drug, uh, then it would clearly be a category that's not protected. If I happen to have a prescription for this medication to which I'm addicted to, that might be a bit of a gray area. Uh, with respect to alcohol, because alcohol is a lawful substance for people who are 21 years of age or older, um, current alcohol abuse and addiction is a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act. So we treat alcohol abuse differently than illegal drug abuse. Um, we treat people who are recovering from alcohol addiction or alcoholism, from drug addiction, uh, the individuals recovering from both, we treat those the same. Once a person is no longer abusing the substance, then they can be considered covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. So if you think about it, we have kind of four categories here. Let me do a little picture. So we have, we'll call this the, the drug section, and this is the alcohol section. This is current usage, and this is past usage. So for uh, current usage of drugs, there is no protection in the Americans with Disabilities Act. For past usage of drugs, and you are still addicted to the drugs, but you are in recovery, yes, there is protection. So I'm just going to put a Y here for yes. Uh, current abuse of alcohol, and you are addicted to alcohol, you are protected. Past abuse of alcohol, and you still are addicted to alcohol, you are protected. Now let's imagine there's somebody who isn't addicted to alcohol, but just so happens to go on a vendor, maybe they're at a bachelor party or a bachelorette party and they imbibe too much and come to work still drunk the next day. They aren't an alcoholic, so the Americans with Disabilities Act doesn't apply to them at all. There would be a similar answer if somebody maybe in the past is known to abuse drugs, um, but was never addicted to drugs, but used it recreationally um, and that was known but because they are not a drug addict, then they would not be protected. So all of this assumes an addiction level event. It just really turns on whether the person is continuing the uh, active use of the substance or not. I'm gonna make that go away. It's a little bit easier to see. So let's examine these issues in a little bit more care. Um, an employer can't ter terminate somebody who has undergone treatment for drug abuse and who is no longer abusing. So an employer is completely okay terminating somebody who is using a drug other than alcohol. 
an uh, employer can absolutely dismiss somebody who abuses alcohol if the person is not an alcoholic. Um, but once a person is in recovery, and of course this is a bit of a gray area, um, you know, let's say I used uh, cocaine yesterday, I haven't used it today, am I now in the category of individuals who are no longer using drugs? I would argue no. I think you'd have to be clean probably for 30 days-ish before you can really be considered a non-drug user. Um, so an interesting issue is what about marijuana? We all know in certain states marijuana has been decriminalized or in fact legalized uh, for recreational and sometimes medical use. Um, the, the state law may well not make it a crime to use marijuana or to sell marijuana, but it still remains a crime under federal law. So it's really not fair to say that marijuana has been decriminalized, it's just been decriminalized under state laws. As a result, it's still okay for employers to go ahead and drug test for those things. Um, because obviously alcohol is a lawful substance and we can do drug tests for that as well. Um, so when we are considering people who are um, drug addicts, recovering drug addicts, and alcoholics recovering or otherwise, the issue to, to decide you know, how we're going to handle that situation is whether that employee is able to perform the essential functions of his or her job with or without reasonable accommodation. They are entitled to reasonable accommodation. So let's just talk through how reasonable accommodation might appear if you have a recovering drug um, addict or alcoholic. What you might do is you might give that person time off so that they can attend uh, therapy or um, Alcoholics Anonymous or the equivalent for, I don't know what it's called, the narcotic, narcotic Users Anonymous, something like that for folks who are experiencing um, drug addiction. So giving time off for that type of therapy. Um, there may also be, if you were running a restaurant or something along those lines, where you might have a particular waiter or waitress who is not responsible for serving alcohol uh, to particular tables. That might or might not be a reasonable accommodation. It probably would turn on what percentage of the business of the restaurant is the sale of alcohol. In some places it might be that every table that people are getting alcohol and therefore would really require that this, the uh, restaurant staff up. On the other hand, say if you're at a uh, Black IP, or a cotton patch, probably not too many people are getting alcohol at those places. And so under those circumstances, for the rare such person who orders a beer or a glass of wine, um, the, the server could um, ask the bartender or another serving person to actually deliver the drinks if being exposed to the alcohol is uh, too tempting a situation for that person. Um, so those are some reasonable accommodations that might make sense. Now, when I said, and you may have been thrown by this, but when I said that current uh, abusers of alcohol who are alcoholics um, can be considered disabled, I don't mean to imply that the employer has to permit people to be drunk at work. Um, and there are a significant number of what I'm going to call functioning alcoholics who um, maybe become severely intoxicated over the weekend when they're not working, but when Monday comes around, they are uh, sober. And so uh, they can continue to do their Monday through Friday job efficiently and productively, even though they have this drinking problem. And so um, when I say that the employer has to treat the uh, current, uh, currently using alcoholic as disabled, that doesn't mean that the employer has to accept somebody coming to work um, hungover and, and uh, uh, not functioning well or intoxicated or reeking of alcohol or unkempt or anything along those lines. Those would not be reasonable accommodations under the 
Okay, so here's a nice summary for the next few slides as to uh, ways of making sure that your drug testing program for current employees works out. Notify the employees about that you're gonna do it, explain when it's gonna happen, explain what's gonna happen if they test positive, make sure your protocols for how you handle the specimens are exactly the way they should be. Uh, the lab that you use should be in a position to train you about how to do that. Document that chain of custody, have two samples for testing, respect the privacy, use good labs, appoint a medical review officer to interpret the results, and be sure um, that there is a way that the employee can uh, share medical information with the medical review officer in the event there's a question about the test results. I may have added this uh, to the uh, notes, so if you don't see it, see your notes already, you may want to add it. Um, and provide rehabilitative drug programs like um, through the employee assistance program that your employer has. Uh, in here. So you can have a disparate treatment test if um, one employee is terminated, the other employee is retained. I suggest that you have um, a very clearly defined uh, policy here. And it is my opinion that it's not helpful to have gradients to say, well, if it's marijuana, you're gonna uh, give them a three-day suspension, but if it's cocaine, it's a month-long suspension. I would just have it positives or negatives. That's my philosophy. Uh, certainly you can have other philosophies. If you decide to get very granular in the policy, you're going to want to make sure that you communicate that policy and everybody understands what that is. And I would highly discourage you from making exceptions for that long-term employee versus that other employee who was hired last week. Um, if it's a positive test, it's a positive test, it's a positive test. Um, kind of already talked about this. So now we've completed the discussion about drug tests. Now we're going to talk about medical examinations. For medical examinations, we have two points of time that are important. Well, first of all, let's define what a medical examination is. It is a procedure or test that seeks information about an individual's impairments or health. Um, that seems pretty straightforward, but there's a lot of gray area about whether a particular test falls into a medical examination and whether it isn't. And it's important that we know whether it's a medical examination or not, because if it is, the American Disabilities Act is going to cover it. If it isn't, the American Disabilities Act probably doesn't have much to do with it one way or the other. So let's talk about um, the, the two time frames. So one type of thing that's like a medical test that could be uh, done before you've even decided for sure you're going to hire this person. But if it is truly a medical exam, as defined by the American Disabilities Act, it meets this definition, then you're going to have to wait to give this test until you've extended a conditional offer of employment. And when you make a conditional offer of employment, you're saying, ah, we want to offer you this, a job. This would be the job, this would be the pay, um, but before you can begin, you have to pass this drug test. The only thing that's stopping you from being able to start is your successful completion of this drug test. So if you fail the drug test, you don't have a job, but if you pass it, you 100% you, you have a job. You're still an at-will employee, but you have, a, you have a guaranteed beginning of that employment. Um, so that's what a conditional offer of employment is. So during that, after that conditional offer of employment, but before the employment actually starts, the medical exam can um, inquire into the physical and mental health of the applicants. Um, and again, once the person starts working, the questions have to be limited to job-related and business necessity. The idea here is that um, the employee is now in a relationship with the employer. Um, they both made a commitment. At this point, the person is still kind of in the applicant category. 
uh, because we have a conditional offer of employment, but employment hasn't actually begun. And so the scope of questioning is a little bit broader at this time. Because of this requirement that we have a conditional offer of employment, medical exams are the last thing that is done before the hiring, or before the, 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 I guess the employment actually begins. This is a nice list. If, if you don't have this in your notes, I would encourage you to take a picture of this slide or to jot it down because this tells you how each one of these tests falls into the category. And again, um, which category it falls into may seem a little bit arbitrary. There is a logic behind it, but you don't need to know the logic in all cases if you can't figure it out. So again, uh, a test for the use of alcohol, that's a medical exam. Test for illegal drugs, not a medical exam. Hmm. Blood pressure screen, medical exam. Agility test, not a medical exam. An HIV test, medical exam. Polygraph, not a medical exam. Genetic test, medical exam. Honesty test, not a medical exam. Um, a psychological test used to diagnose a mental illness, medical exam used to tell personality traits like extrovertism or like Myers-Briggs or something like that. Because it's not attempting to diagnose a mental illness, it's not considered a medical exam. Vision tests in which um, a, a, a doctor of some type is evaluating it, medical exam. A vision test that where somebody's asked to read some text, to, you know, a document, for example, um, or to recognize certain objects, uh, that would not be a medical exam. An MRI or other type of medical checkup procedure, clearly a medical exam, demonstrating that you can do certain tasks like uh, filing documents or lifting a 50 pound weight and carrying it from the loading dock into the uh, trailer. That would not be a medical exam. You can see in most of these cases, maybe with the possible exception of this first one, these don't really have a medical test aspect to them. Um, there isn't any kind of medical supplies, no medical, specialized medical equipment is being used, again, with the possible exception of that top choice, whereas the others either involve medical professionals or medical equipment. So here's kind of an example of how this timeline works. So nothing can happen before an offer is made. Um, once an offer is made, you can do pretty much unrestricted medical testing. After the offer is made and the employment begins, you can do medical testing, but it's going to need to be um, consistent with um, business necessity, or the employee has to agree to it and say, okay, yeah, I, I want that test. I want to get that information about myself. Um, so can the results be used to deny employment when the person is disabled? Because again, all these protections are under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Now they do protect people who aren't disabled. These particular aspects of the law do protect people who are disabled or not disabled. Um, you know, so I can't be asked, uh, for example, I myself am not disabled, but I can't be given an HIV test before I have extended a job offer, um, even though I don't meet the definition of a disabled person under the Americans with Disabilities Act. But it's focused on protecting people with disabilities. And so can the results be used? Only if that particular employee cannot perform the essential functions of the job, even with reasonable accommodation. Remember, we saw this language back here. Here. The inquiry must be whether the employee is able to perform the essential function of the job with or without reasonable accommodation. Those are, those are kind of magic words under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Or uh, the person is a direct threat to himself or herself or others. I gave the example earlier on this presentation about the epileptic individual who was being considered for a position in which he or she would and need to routinely climb a high ladder. And uh, this person's epilepsy wasn't the type that the person knew ahead of time that he or she was about to have a seizure. Well, under those circumstances, um, 
they are at risk to themselves because if they have the seizure, they're likely to fall off the ladder, hurting themselves and or hurting anyone who is below them at that time. And so um, that can be a basis for denying that person that particular position. Um, testing for prescription drugs taken for medical conditions that might be disabling is a medical exam. So again, when the test for illegal drugs happens, um, if a person is taking a lawful substance that maybe has some chemical similarities with unlawful substances, sometimes that will become known. And that's one of the reasons why we want that conversation between the medical review officer and the employee to be confidential. And what that employee shares to the medical review officer about his or her prescription for, for um, you know, Percocet or something like that um, is uh, uh, confidential. If the medical review officer is able to confirm that uh, the employee had a current prescription for Percocet then, or whatever the drug might be, uh, then what the medical review officer would do would be to inform the company that this employee was negative on the test. Not positive, but excused simply negative. And so the employer would never know that there was even an issue about the test results in that particular case. Let's talk about AIDS. We are probably all familiar with what AIDS is. It stands for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. It's a syndrome in which the person's immune system ceases to function normally and the person becomes um, especially susceptible to other diseases, many of which can cause fatality. And the virus that causes um, AIDS is HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. So uh, generally speaking, HIV testing in the workplace, it doesn't make a lot of sense. For one thing, it is not communicable to normal um, uh, exposure type situations, unless you're wearing a little brothel in, in uh, Nevada or something along those lines. Um, so uh, it is not clear that there are really very many situations at all that there'd be a legitimate business reason to conduct an HIV test. Perhaps a surgeon who, um, because he's using this or she's using the scalpel, um, may uh, need to, you know, I could see maybe somebody in that position uh, might need that kind of um, uh, testing, but it would be a very unusual situation. Another problem with HIV testing, which makes it not very effective, is that the HIV test uh, isn't going to tell you whether that person has HIV today. There can be a weeks or months long delay from the time of exposure until that person uh, it would test positive. And so a negative test doesn't really mean a lot. I mean, a positive test does mean the person has the disease, obviously. So an HIV positive person um, can be protected under the Americans Disabilities Act as well as the Federal Location Rehabilitation Act. Um, as, a, as a rule, the Americans Disability Act provides that employers may not make an employment decision based upon an individual's HIV status. Let me share, you, share a story with you about um, how HIV can play a role in uh, the, the non-medical uh, work, workforce. Um, when I was working with a retailer, um, there was a minor, somebody 16 or 17, who was um, working in um, this retailer. And as commonly happens in retailers, sometimes clothes are pinned either to mannequins or sometimes to the hangers. And these were just straight pins. They might have been safety pins, but very likely straight pins. Anyway, this worker was removing the pins and um, I can't remember if it was a male or female, but we'll say she. She jabbed herself accidentally with the pin. She didn't bleed a lot, but she bled a non-trivial amount. She kind of gassed herself pretty good. Uh, the garment was ruined and 
you know, there was blood on her clothes and it was not hugely significant. She, we didn't have to get a blood transfusion or anything like that, but it was more than just a drop or two of blood. Well, this particular individual uh, was known by people in the store to lead an alternative lifestyle at that time. Um, I can't remember if it was a woman and she was um, lesbian or if it was a man and he was gay, but whichever one it was, there was um, that aspect of his or her lifestyle. And the parents of the child, according to the child, were unaware of this lifestyle situation. Well, um, in the process of cleaning up the garment and the blood and assisting with a bandage for the employee, some workers wanted to know this employee's HIV status. And so it became this whole deal in the store is we'll call this person Bob. Is Bob HIV positive? I want to know because I was exposed to his blood. Um, but of course, uh, Bob hadn't been tested for HIV, and how could we, we couldn't require him to be tested? And again, if we required it or talked to his parents about it, then Bob's um, situation with his parents perhaps could be affected. And generally, uh, employers, even employers of minors, uh, typically try to as much as possible keep the relationship between the employee and the employer and not to include the parents except for necessary. So there can be times where things are more complicated than one might think. Uh, Bob may have been engaging in uh, uh, risky behavior, uh, sexually risky behavior uh, that might have exposed him to HIV. He might have had the disease at that time. He might have, therefore, the blood might have had, had the virus, the HIV virus in it. So these coworkers might have been exposed to the blood, through the blood um, of Bob. There were lots of, of complicated issues. Um, ultimately, uh, Bob did not get a test for HIV, and his parents weren't informed. And as far as I know, nobody ultimately ended up being positive for HIV under those circumstances. But you can see how these issues can be. Uh, quite upsetting and quite complicated. So Bob um, finds out that one of his mechanics is HIV positive. Subsequently, uh, Arthur, the employee, is terminated even though um, his HIV status would have no relevance to his ability to repair cars and he was performing his job satisfactorily. Under these circumstances, Arthur can assert a violation of the American Disabilities Act because of his HIV status. Let's, um, at this point, we're going to um, end our presentation. And in our next presentation, we'll talk about genetic tests polygraph and honesty tests, and also scored tests of ability. Again, as always, if you have any questions about the material that we've covered, please feel free to pop into my office hours. I'm always glad to talk about these issues with folks. I appreciate your attention, and I hope that you have a wonderful day. Take care.